Hey everyone, and welcome back to Pixels, the show where we talk about the video games industry and try to look at what's been happening and understand it. I do say we try because... Sometimes we don't. Um, this is another Patrick Solo show. It's been a, a challenging week with a sick baby and a bunch of other things. So, um, But th there was so much news, I didn't want to not do a show. And uh, there's a lot to talk about and a lot of really interesting stuff. So I hope you enjoy this uh, little episode. And let's just get started. The, the first big piece of news, I, we're going to get to everything. Like We're going to talk about... Sony not being at E3, the exclusive, non-exclusives for uh, Xbox, the things that are happening for Google with Stadia, um, the delays, the meta delays, and a bunch of interesting uh, new things that have been announced. Uh, so yeah, we're going to get to all of that. But first, uh, the biggest news, I suppose, the Sony and Microsoft dueling announcements that have nothing to do with one another, but that are still pretty big. The first one um, to talk about relatively quickly is Sony is not going to be at E3 this year again, which I was pretty sure they would be at E3 because at least for this year, maybe not in future years, because with the presentation of the PlayStation 5, um, the official unveiling this year, E3 would be a great place to do it because when you do specialized events, even um, direct communication like Nintendo Directs or State of Play, I think you reach mostly um, dedicated, specialized media. And for these things, you need to reach wide uh, consumer media. You need to get, you know, the TV stations, the general uh, newspapers, etc., but I guess things have changed in the past uh, five years, and the 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 um, power, the name recognition of something like Sony and PlayStation is enough to get those media to talk about uh, this, even if they do it in a specialized communication. I guess Nintendo does that. Uh, Microsoft does it as well, and. We, I think the difference between now and the announcement of the last generation is that most big publications, <clears throat> most big publications have specialized uh, journalists that cover video games. So even within, I don't know, Bloomberg, the New York Times uh, in France, you know, big publications like Le Monde or Le Figaro, which are the main newspapers, to give an example you're going to have gaming tech slash gaming and sometimes gaming specifically uh, teams of at least a few journalists who are going to cover this. Um, and so in previous generations, you would need to do this at those big events so that the, the journalists from those publications would be sent to the event and cover it. Um, but regardless... What's certain is that Sony feels they don't need to be at E3, and that means something for Sony. It also means something for E3. Um, what is E3 going to be without Sony uh, and maybe without others going forward? Microsoft is, is there kind of in name only. They're not on the show floor. They have their own Microsoft theater close to it. Um Nintendo is there also, but at the Treehouse. Um, Activision hasn't been there in years. EA has their own uh, little event. It might be that Sony ends up doing a presentation close to E3. Um, the big rumor now is that the PlayStation 5 will be unveiled in uh, February, which is possible in a direct video live stream uh, that probably would happen as journalists are invited to try stuff physically so they would have a, um, a, a special event. It is entirely possible. I think even if that is the case, they might still have something around E3 as well, maybe a week before or something like that. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens there. But for E3, certainly the question that has been uh, asked is, does that mean E3 is irrelevant at this point? And I think that that is a little bit premature. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that um, 
E3 is going to disappear. I think the closest example we have to compare this to is CES or um, which one was it? Macworld. I mean, there are a number of tech events where the big, um, some of the bigger manufacturers left. Um, Apple isn't at CES anymore. Apple isn't at well, Macworld. I guess still exists, but it's not a bit as big a deal. I don't. I'm not even sure it still exists. Um, but CES is still there because even if the big players like Apple or Samsung or others even can do big announcements on their own, you still have a lot of smaller companies, not necessarily the tiniest companies, but smaller companies that don't have the same um, name recognition and, and uh, brand power, I suppose, and need that kind of a event to get a little bit of visibility. So obviously CES didn't go anywhere. I don't think E3 is going to go anywhere, um, but it might, uh, you might see more and more of those big companies kind of move in parallel to it. Uh, Microsoft is still supporting it because they are still on their redemption story storyline. Um, it, it, if, everything goes super well with uh, the next generation of, of Xbox. Well, first of all, they're uh, removing generations kind of a little bit, but um, I'm not sure they need to be there until, you know, for the next 10 years, for example. Um, it still fits, it certainly fits their style of communication for now. So it, I don't think E3 is going to disappear. You're always going to have uh, smaller quote unquote companies. Like if, Sony, in their current state, if the big dog starts speaking, everyone listens no matter what the venue. Nintendo has a special relationship with the gaming world. Everyone will listen. Sony is currently the big dog. Everyone will listen. But if you start getting, you know, Sony, Microsoft, uh, Nintendo, uh, who knows, 2K, Bethesda, um, Gearbox and all of those, like if you get one of those a month, it's not that like super committed gamers like us are still going to probably hear about all of them, but they start, you start getting diminishing returns. And for those types of uh, companies, E3 is a great opportunity to get um, taken in the glow of the entire event. So <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't think E3 is going anywhere, but certainly it is going to change. And from the ESA point of view, which is the organization that puts E3 together, the uh, Electronic Software Association, I believe, um, it's the gaming industry uh, or organizing body, essentially. Uh, they need to do things if they want E3 to keep going because it is their main, um, well, not their main, but it's a big part of their revenue that E3 represents. And a lot of people compare E3 to Gamescom, it's really hard to compare the two. Gamescom has been a consumer-focused event for a long time. E3 has kind of hesitated between consumer-focused and industry-focused. It's opened itself more to uh, consumers. But I don't know that that's necessarily the best, answers, the best answer. I don't think E3 can turn itself into Gamescom. Um, First of all, it doesn't seem possible to get as many visitors as, Game as Gamescom. It's like two months before and Gamescom already exists and has that spot, like right before the fall season begins for everyone to showcase their games in a more playable state. Um, it's difficult for E3 to uh, turn into something that will compensate for what's happening now. I don't know what the answer is, um, but yeah, regardless, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's always going to be an event, and I think it's always going to be uh, the event, honestly, but uh, we'll see. Another bit of news that is uh, connected to something Microsoft said is we're hearing reports that, well, so first, yeah, the reports that, that Horizon Zero Dawn, of course, a PlayStation exclusive, might be coming to PC, which is really interesting because Sony has been uh, a very dedicated to its platform and trying to get their games on PC as well 
is an unexpected event. We heard this about MLB The Show, but that's kind of a special kind of game. Um, and of course, Death Stranding, which uses the same engine as Horizon Zero Dawn, Death Stranding is coming to PC. So there's a little bit of a bridge there. And Horizon Zero Dawn is, what, three, four years old now. Um, so I, I think it could make sense for Sony to bring their some, at least, of their big franchises to PC. But I don't expect that to happen um, day and date as it does for Microsoft. Um, I think, I mean, it is a different market, but you do start losing a little bit of oomph uh, because Sony's big um, power has been the those exclusives. And I don't think they will give that away entirely. Um, although, you know, with the streaming service that is expected to be um, pushed more and more with the next generation it will be available everywhere, right? The, the, the streaming service will mean that you will be able to play those games that are available on it, and we suspect that all of them will be available. The big uh, PlayStation 5 and Xbox games are going to be available on those streaming services. It does mean that it's available anywhere anyway. So if people are going to be able to play on their PC through a browser or an app or whatever... Uh, they they are going to be able to play those games. Does it make sense to keep that um, walled garden, <laughs> the, the, the walls on the walled garden as high as before? Probably not. Um, it, it doesn't change everything from, you know, the, the day the next generation launches. It doesn't mean that from one day to the next, all of that is available because it's going to take a little while for the streaming services to be as important as we expect they might become down the line. But it does mean that it's probably a good idea to prepare for those things and to act accordingly, to, to <clears throat> act in the way the world is going to become and not keep wishing that it was the way it was before those changes happened. Um, so it could make sense that Sony would start doing this. But... Um, on the other hand, we also had a report that, um, well, I guess Sony said directly they will have next-gen exclusive games, which is a little bit of a different story, but they will have next-gen exclusive games uh, on the PlayStation 5, which is a response to the next big story I want to tackle, um, Microsoft announcing that there won't be um, any Xbox Series X exclusive games for the first year or two after launch. Uh, those games, the big Microsoft games, um, the first party games that we're talking about first party games specifically, they will be available on both the Xbox Series X and the Xbox One. So, and by the way, also on PC. So they're kind of still exclusive to the Xbox platform, but not exclusive to this generation specifically, which is completely in line with Microsoft's um, philosophy for developing the platform. Um, the Xbox Game Pass is part of that philosophy. They want you to play their games no matter where you play them, and that makes complete sense uh, when they you see how they think about their strategy for the next... Again, I say generation, but it's not really a generation anymore. It's more the Xbox, the Xbox platform, and you have different types of devices that you can play those games on. The most um, powerful one being the Xbox Series X console, which is going to launch soon. And it does bring questions, though, because traditionally the big... Uh, um, crown jewel of a launching generation has been those exclusive games. And I say crown jewel because it's the most visible thing, but we're all aware and understanding. There are conflicting feelings about all of those things because those exclusive games have had little time to be developed. Usually the specs are finalized a year or you know a few months a year maybe a little bit longer before the console launches and they've been developed for a couple of years maybe um and so they are usually not the 
most incredible games that you will find. Obviously, uh, given that they're exclusive to a new generation, which has a, a limited installed base, those games aren't as... Uh, um, the, the developers aren't going to put as much resources as they would in games that they put out for a platform that has a huge installed base. That often means they focus on graphics because that's an easy way of showcasing the capabilities of the new generation. And I think that has value for gamers as well because they want, when they buy a new generation... They want to see what it can do, even if those games aren't the best games there, there is. Um, a the, the couple of examples come to mind from the last generation. Um, Rise Son of Rome on the Xbox One was beautiful, but maybe not the best games. The best game there was. Uh, the Order came out a little bit after, a little bit later, I think. I don't think it came out with PlayStation 4. Uh, again, super beautiful game. It wasn't a good game. <laughs> there were some games that were better. Um, um, Infamous Second Son, I think, was a, a pretty good game. But in general, no one expects those exclusive games to be um, generation-defining in any way. So it's understandable. So the big problem with not having exclusive games is that the important thing to mention, the games that are developed cross-generation can't really take full advantage of the next generation's exclusive features. It's possible to adapt, of course, and certainly a game that is cross-generation is going to look better and feel better probably on the more powerful generation than on the last one. Um, and especially if the game is developed with that next generation in mind, um, and then adapted to the previous generation, which I guess there are two ways you can go about it. Either you develop for the new generation and adapt it to the last one, or the other way around. In the first case, you'll have a game that is probably better um, looking, better taking advantage of the new features. Um, but even then, you can't do things with your game that aren't possible to do with the last generation. So, well, I mean, you can to an extent, but it can't be core to the game. It can be added like a layer of paint and uh, it can be added features. But usually it means that you're not going to take full advantage of the new stuff. And that can be a bummer. Um, however, <laughs> um, the... Again, those cross-generation games are, uh, the, I, I'm sorry, the, the new uh, exclusives to the new generation aren't that great. So why bother? You need to wait for a couple of years anyway for the installed base to justify that uh, investment. So it's kind of a, a, a um, bummer, but only for superficial reasons. But there are superficial reasons that matter, if that makes sense. Um, it, it, it could end up being that those big games like Halo Infinite or whatever Microsoft is cooking will be really impressive on Xbox Series X. Um, and the other, uh, the third party developers are going to be able to do whatever they want. So that's, they, they are going to have cross generation games. Um, uh, they might have, uh, sorry, new generation exclusive games, uh, potentially. We've heard of at least one game for the PlayStation 5 called uh, Godfall, which, by the way, there was a leaked uh, gameplay little bit um, just recently, which actually might mean that that uh, February reveal for PlayStation 5 is not uh, completely impossible because if those things start leaking, it might be because they're preparing uh, to showcase it to showcase it during that presentation. Maybe I don't know. We'll see. But there might be exclusive games to the Xbox One, PlayStation Five, or maybe even uh, I said Xbox One, Xbox Series X, next generation, uh, or maybe even um, exclusive to that console. It seems very unlikely, but does it matter? I think it does. I mean, to me. It matters a little bit. I'm going to be happy to get my like uh, shiny new graphics game that is uh, going to showcase the PlayStation 5 uh, capabilities when it launches. Hopefully, we'll see. But um, beyond that, 
it it does mean something for Microsoft's strategy for the next generation, blurring the lines between the generations. The exclusives will come at some point. Uh, the people who are buying Xbox Ones or who are buying Xbox, who have bought Xbox Ones are going to be happy that they're going to be able to play Halo Infinite just as um, their Xbox Series X uh, owners will be, owner friends will be. Um, and at some point, the exclusives will arrive. And to be honest, the people who um, will buy the Xbox Series X, it might be that the games are so pretty that it doesn't matter that they're available on the Xbox One uh, for the enjoyment, for the justification of the new um, device, of the purchase of the new device. Um, it might, however, mean that the Xbox Series X isn't sold as much as the PlayStation 5, because if you have to make a choice when you buy your new generation console, um, you look at the Xbox Series X, the games that are there are, are also available on the Xbox One that you already own. PlayStation 5, there are a couple of exclusive games that you can't get anywhere else. I have to choose one of the two. Well, maybe I'm going to get the PlayStation 5, which means PS5 might get a higher installed base than uh, Microsoft. Then the Series X uh, depends on the price as well, by the way. We might see a Series S that is cheaper priced, but still has a, uh, uh, some of the capabilities of the Series X. That might blur the lines even more. But even if the PlayStation 5 has a better start on number of uh, consoles installed after you know six months or whatever... It doesn't really matter to make Microsoft anymore because they're not fighting that battle now. So yeah, it's it's a it's a mess. It's a lot of things to take into account and a lot of things that are kind of contradicting one another. I think we don't know how it will shake up because it's like looking at different um, KPIs for those who know the marketing lingo. Uh, the key performance uh, indicators, I think, is the is the uh, uh, acronym. Basically, we're looking at different numbers now. And what does it mean? How do we know which one is succeeding more than the other? Uh, it might not matter to some, and I guess it doesn't matter down the line. But uh, to an extent, it kind of does, because the Xbox One, having uh, uh, stumbled out of the gate, has had dire consequences for the entire generation for Microsoft and for Sony and for everyone else. So um, those things are the underlying causes of everything that happens in the industry. Um, all right, that's enough of that. I've, uh, I think, covered every single thing I wanted to uh, talk about. So there you go. Uh, let's talk about the other platform. You might think I want to talk about Nintendo, but no, Stadia. Yeah, um, <laughs> I've made my feelings about Stadia clear a number of times. They've announced they are going to have 120 Stadia titles coming in 2020. That's a lot of titles. Um, they're probably going to be available on... Well, they are actually going to be, uh, for the most part, games that are available on other platforms. But they're going to have 10 platform exclusives. I think their exact wording is launch exclusives, which might mean um, titles that are time-limited exclusives. I, I'm guessing they're pulling out their wallet and trying to pay for timed exclusives. Um, but 120 titles is better than what they have now. Um, and they are going to have some of the features that they promised that are going to be available. They kind of had a, a roadmap, which honestly is not super exciting. Um, there's nothing there that makes you think, oh my God, this is going to be awesome all of a sudden. Um, I'd be curious to see, of course, the 10 exclusives. Um, this is, again, it's funny, we were talking about exclusives for 15 minutes now. And this is what drives adoption. Um, exclusives are important, for, especially for new platforms. And even if the exclusives on the Series X aren't, well, exclusive to the Series X, they're still exclusive to Microsoft. Um, it's, we might see 
Halo Infinite come to the Switch, I guess, at some point. But th you still need some exclusives that are exclusive to your platform. I can't say exclusives anymore. Um, to drive adoption. And so, of course, uh, 10 games that you're only going to be able to play on Stadia, if they get even just a couple of those that are really exciting, and that's a big if because the platform is limited, um, that could be a big thing. Uh, to me, what they still aren't talking about, it, the, the most important thing to me is when are they going to open the floodgates? Uh, when are they going to make that thing available without the founder's subscription or the pro subscri subscription? And they aren't talking about this. However, another thing that is really interesting, I think, um, show the, and that shows why that technology is different and can be cool, is BT, which I guess used to be British Telecom, um, is uh, partnering with Stadia in the UK, with Google, Google in the UK, um, to provide free uh, Stadia Premiere, which is essentially the founder's pack, um, for some of the uh, internet plans. And that means that people who subscribe to uh, British Telecom or BT, to some of their uh, fiber, I guess, broadband, maybe cable plans, are going to have access to Stadia uh, for free, which is not, you know, Stadia Pro, Stadia Premiere uh, for free, which gives you some free games. Um, once the Stadia service is available widely, it's not going to matter as much, but I'm pretty sure it means that the data centers and the connections are going to be top-notch between BT and Stadia, which means that's going to be very playable. Uh, for those subscribers. And that's essentially giving, um, it's the equivalent of BT giving away a PlayStation 4 or an Xbox One um, to all of its subscribers, which wouldn't be possible, uh, would be much more difficult if this was a physical thing. Of course, as a cloud gaming service, these kinds of deals are possible. And that's, I think, where we're seeing that this technology enables things that weren't possible bef before and things which are really exciting um, for that space. So that is the kind of thing that we should keep an eye on. And uh, I think it's going to keep happening and it's going to change the way we approach the, the all of those uh, platforms. All right, so we've talked about Sony, we've talked about Microsoft, we've talked about uh, Google, you know what? Let me throw in a bit of Nintendo news here. Let me find it in my rundown. Um, in Europe, Nintendo has uh, uh, won a uh, lawsuit brought by the some Nordic countries, I think, or th those Germans as well. Yeah, it's German, uh, German, uh, 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 a German consumer association um, that called out. Uh, oh, and it's in Norway as well. There you go. Um, oh, no, it's not Norway. Anyway, the point is, <laughs> uh, when you pre-order something on the Nintendo eShop, uh, you give away your uh, right to cancel that pre-order within 14 days, which you are able to do on other platforms. On PlayStation Store, Steam, on the Epic Game Store, you can cancel that. Uh, everyone says pre-order. That's not really what it is. A pre-order, I think, usually you might pay some amount of money, but it's mostly that you say you want it. What we're talking about here, and on most devices, uh, on most platforms, we're talking about pre-purchase, which is very different. Um, you can still, because pre-order... If you give a little bit of money, you can cancel it. Even if you don't, it's not exactly the same thing as having paid the full thing. Anyway, point is, on uh, the Nintendo eShop, you can't cancel. And that is in the uh, EULA, uh, in the uh, um, agreement that you <laughs> agreed to with the store. And what has happened on the EU level is that uh, they have said... 
this is acceptable, even though you're supposed to be able to uh, change your mind within 14 days when you buy something online. Um, that it's, if you agree to the EULA, then it is uh, acceptable because it is part of the uh, EU. Uh, there's a directive that says if you agree to it, if you have given your express consent, then it's okay to not have that right. And that's funny because, well, there are a couple of things. First of all, I wouldn't be surprised if the others <laughs> now start doing the same thing. Given that this has been settled for Nintendo, I wonder if uh, Sony and Valve and the others won't start saying, well, you know what, it's legal. So if you do pre-purchase with us, you also can't cancel within 14 days. Although who cancels after 14 days? I think it's, if you want to cancel, some people will, of course, but I think it's like when you hear that there's a delay or when you see more about the game, you figure, oh, that maybe wasn't the, the a thing I wanted. Um, but they might leave it in, but I wouldn't be surprised to see, see them remove that possibility as well. So that's one thing. But the other thing is, um, it's funny how people are so excused so much with Nintendo because that's kind of a shitty thing to do, especially if the others don't do it. And Nintendo gets a pass on so many things. Uh, we see them getting some, uh, 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 catching some crap sometimes. Uh, the Joy-Con drift is certainly exam an example of that. Although... I think if this had been another manufacturer, um, the, the shitstorm would have been much bigger. It's like literally your console becomes non-functional after a while for a large number of owners. And they've been very slow to change things. It's still going on even on their new model. It's like it's a, it's a big deal. And I don't think we're hearing... Uh, this, the, the complaints, the angry uh, gamers aren't as angry at, at Nintendo as they would be at other companies. Um, and even things like uh, Dexit, you know, the uh, Pokemon issues, they've been directed at Game Freak, not at Nintendo, which, I, again, as I've said before, when you talk about Pokemon, it's a Nintendo game. Right? It, it, everyone in everyone's mind, this is a Nintendo game. But when something goes wrong, oh, no, 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 it's not Nintendo's fault. It's Game Freak's fault. Um, so, anyway, it just made me smile. It's, it's funny. It doesn't really matter all that much. But I, I sometimes like to point out those inconsistencies. Everyone, I think, you, you will find people in the uh, <laughs> gaming fandom, which... I'm not a huge fan of personally, but uh, who always think, oh, you always, you know, the, the fans of Microsoft always say, ah, oh, you, you hate us and you treat us unfairly. And then the fans of Sony will say the same if something, well, although Sony has been on top of the world for a while, but, you know, there's this dynamic that happens. But really, most people treat those companies fairly, I think. When there's... Uh, something happening, it's usually justified. Um, usually. Uh, but with the, the one that doesn't get a fair treatment is Nintendo. The, the, the fans are rabid in their love. And there's like this image of a small, uh, uh, small company that cares about its players. And I mean, yeah, sure. It's like, I, I could talk about Nintendo for a long time. I love them, of course. But um, it's... Yeah, it, it was funny that this wasn't a big deal when I think if, if that had been levied against Sony or Microsoft or Valve or anyone else, it would have been a much bigger deal. But anyway, so uh, pre-purchase a game on the eShop, you don't get to change your mind. And yeah, we shouldn't pre-purchase. I think everyone knows that. Uh, it, especially on digital stuff. It literally doesn't change anything. You can, if you really want a pre-purchase bonus, you can do that the day before and it will be there. Uh, you don't have to pre-purchase uh, months in advance. It's essentially interest-free uh, <laughs> loan that you give to someone. It's ridiculous. Like companies get 
huge amounts of money for nothing just because they promise you a uh, you know shiny thing that might or might not be shiny. It's I I, I sometimes do it for games that I know I'm going to want, whether or not they are good. But as a rule, it's important to remember that. Anyway, pre-orders. Um, all right. We've done all the big ones. Now let's tackle the other big story, um, which is multiple uh, little stories. Then we'll talk about the, some uh, general game news. But the other big story is delays. Oh, my Lord. Uh, so many delays. Cyberpunk 2077 delayed from April, I believe, to September. Avengers delayed from May to September. Final Fantasy VII Remake. Um, well, that was supposed to come out in March. It's coming out in April, but still a little delay. Iron Man VR. Uh, Iron Man VR delayed from February to May. Dying Light 2 delayed in indefinitely. That is a lot of stuff <laughs> that is being delayed. They're all pushing up against uh, the release of the next generation. That uh, seems like a, a, a certainty here. But it's a lot of stuff being delayed. And there are a number of different reactions to this. Um, I think I haven't... Uh, I've seen some people say that gamers are pissed about the delays which I haven't seen so much myself. I don't think that it seems to me like an old type of reaction. I think we've seen so many um, games come out in a state that they shouldn't have come out in that people are now okay with delays. I think five years ago, if you announced a delay, people would be angry at you and they would want to play their game and you know the that that's the attitude that leads part of the attitude that leads to people saying that gamers are entitled um but that that at least that part i think is not so common anymore we've kind of had a, an education forced upon us by those wonky releases and the education that the 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 press has uh, um has it done uh, by saying, you know, when a game is delayed, it's because it's not ready and it needs to be worked on more to be polished and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's the press, it's a reaction of everyone. Um, so now when a game is delayed, it, I think the general reaction, sure, you're going to have people that are angry for no reason or because they wanted to play the thing that are bummed out, understandably. But generally, the 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 feeling that overtakes that is well okay the game is not ready it should be ready so there's that on one hand at least that's been my experience we want the games to be good um on the other hand there's the question of the issue of crunch which of course um when you are working super hard in the past few months sometimes longer to finish a game and it's delayed by five or six months. We would love for it to mean that it's delayed so that you don't have to crunch to finish stuff and you have a little bit more time. And so you won't have to crunch. But the reality is it probably means more crunch. It probably means you're going to have more months of crunch to get the game ready. And... I guess this is unavoidable and it's certainly a concern and it has been in the, the industry for, uh, it's been a concern that's been brought to people's mind um, in, in the past few months and couple of years. Um, I would hope that <laughs> crunch would be more reasonable um, than it has been before. There was a Q&A, or I think it was an investor's call at CD Projekt Red, um, where the uh, leaders of CD Projekt Red, the CEO said, yes, we will need to crunch. Unfortunately, we try to be reasonable, but we will need to crunch. My hope is that they don't want to say we're not going to crunch because they understand that they, there will be some crunch, but my hope is that it won't be horrible crunch as it has been in the past. It will be managed crunch. Um, I think it's important to, to note, as we often do, 
Um, brunch in itself, I think, can't entirely disappear. I think it would be unreasonable to expect no one to ever work harder than they do on regular work hours. Um, I think sometimes it's it, people actually want to make something as 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 good as it can be and will work harder longer uh, for a period of time. I think the issue, the real issue um, happens when that period of time it become extended um, beyond what's reasonable. Now, I don't know how you define what's reasonable, but so the period of time is longer and we've seen that way too much in the industry and that intensity is too high. You know, if you start getting to uh, 100 hour weeks, even, you know, even something like 60, 70 hour weeks on an expended, extended period of time, that is very unsustainable. And it's caused problems in the industry before. So, uh, yeah, again, I'm sure on all of these games, there will be crunch. Um, my hope would be that it is managed. And um, I hope that if it isn't, I, essentially, I hope that at some point down the line, we get some um, leaked <laughs> uh, reports from people working at those companies, letting us know how the situation was for them in those few months. Um, it's be happened before. That's why we know how things have uh, gone. And there's no reason it wouldn't happen again. So I hope uh, the people working there would let us know if things are unacceptable. And I would hope that even if they are acceptable, I'm saying leak because obviously anything official is kind of hard to trust. Um, but if it's someone uh, emailing someone, a, a journalist, uh, without their employer's knowledge, obviously you'll, you're going to have more a more candid report. And maybe someone could do that and say, you know, if you have several reports of people saying, you know, it was harder, but management really uh, uh, made sure that it was, again, reasonable and managed because of all of those scandals we've had in the years, in the previous years, it would be heartening. So that would be my hope. I might be a little bit uh, Pollyanna, but I don't know. I, I think it's not entirely impossible that at least at some of those studios, that crunch would be managed. We'll see, I guess, maybe. But uh, beyond that, yeah, it's a little bit uh, of a bummer that uh, they're coming out later. But I think it's less of a bummer than before because we have so many uh, great games that we play that we can play from the last couple of years and even with all of those there are still games coming out in the next few months so um it's gonna it's it spreads things out a little bit more which i think is not a bad thing um if there were no games on the horizon i would be maybe a little bit more bummed out but there are a lot of things to play and enjoy anyway and it's not so far off everything is like within eight months um and there are there are things coming within those eight months so i'm i'm okay um waiting for those games uh, for me the sentiment of i want them to make them as good as possible um is the large majority um the other thing uh, especially for the avengers game <laughs> I want this one to be good because I love the Avengers. Um, the other thing that was mentioned was Cyberpunk might have been delayed so that they can optimize it for current generation consoles, Xbox One and PS4, because it runs like crap, is what we're hearing. I don't know how accurate that can be. I'm sure it's difficult to optimize it for those consoles. Um, as people know, I think Corey Bar Barlog said on, on Twitter, um, it's Santa Monica, you know, God of War, dude. Um, games run like crap until... The optimization is the last thing you do on a game. Um, and it, they, they run badly until the last couple of months. Um, it doesn't mean that there isn't any substance behind this rumor, but I do... What it, I'm not a developer, but my understanding is also that um, re, games really are optimized in the last few months and they're all really bad uh performance wise until that happens 
but it might be that this is an issue. It doesn't seem like the issue to like it doesn't seem like the only issue that they would delay it for by you know what is it from april to september so five months if that was the issue i think the delay would have been more reasonable but um who knows i think that there is general polish on a number of fronts um and then i guess that also begs the question of this is going to come out like two months before the next generation it does in general, for all of those games, does beg the question of what's going to happen if you buy them on the current generation and then you get the next generation. And as I've said uh, on Twitter, we've discussed this with a few friends, um, we won't really know until the uh, platform holders announce how it's going to work because it could go a number of different ways. Um, my feeling is that since there is backwards compatibility, and that's a given, um, you're going to get your, let's say, let's take the example of um, Sony because it's easier. They have clear names for their generations. Um, you buy a PS4 game, it will run on PS5, and you will get a 4K 60 FPS kind of as a patch if necessary for free, kind of. But if you want... Uh, other features like ray tracing or um, or, or maybe, maybe that in that free tier, the uh, faster access to the SSD will be included as well because this is simple hardware stuff that kind of happens automatically on an uh, um, OS level. But if you want additional, if you want essentially the PS5 version that might come out down the line with, you know, the ray tracing and uh, reorganizing of the game files so that you have no loading at all and re-architecturing of uh, some parts of the game, I think for that, you'll have to pay, not pay the full price, but maybe pay, you know, 10, 20 bucks to upgrade to the actual PS5 version. Um, that seems like it would make sense to me as a strategy. And maybe some companies will feel like they want to give you that version for free. It wouldn't surprise me if CD Projekt Red does that. <laughs> um, but it doesn't seem unreasonable to me that you get your uh, previous generation game, it runs better on your new generation, but if you want the things that um, are essentially additional dev time, even if it was baked in because it's available on PC, but so it needs to be adapted. If you want the nominal next generation version of the title, then you have to pay a little bit to upgrade it. it I think that's how it's going to work. We'll see. We'll see. And But that is certainly going to be uh, determined, mandated by the platform holders. So Sony will say what... Um, developers can and can't do with those um, and so you'll have consistent policy on that platform level um all right game news uh, legends of runeterra is available in open beta it just became available like literally uh, a few hours ago i launched it before starting the show just to see the ui and uh, i played like one round so i have no idea what it is but on the UI level, it's uh, really polished, uh, unsurprisingly. It seems Riot ha has taken a couple of pages from uh, Blizzard's book, and it feels kind of Blizzard-y as, you know, it's, again, it's not unexpected, but it seems like a Blizzard-y game that is more complex. It 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 was just one round and I already had like compared, maybe it's because I'm used to Hearthstone and Hearthstone is very simple, um, but I, I could grasp Hearthstone within seconds. Whereas for this, even though I do know uh, I have the, the basics in my mind for Hearthstone, it was like, oh wait, okay. So I put the card down, but then I, they attack. And then there's a little bit, it goes a little bit in the direction of uh, magic which I think is, is Riot's uh, strength. They don't try to make it incredibly accessible to everyone. You do have to invest a little bit. It's, you know, what they always say with uh, League of Legends and what they said they would try to replicate with their other games, including Legends of Runeterra. So 
that uh, hopefully brings depth and uh, uh, strategy to this game that maybe you don't find in simpler games. We'll see. I'll I'll play it a little bit for sure, but um, it's it's a really polished experience, at least in the like two minutes I spent with it. But regardless, it's open beta. You can go and play it now if you want to. So go check it out. We've heard a little bit from Doom Eternal. Um, there was a play session a few a couple of weeks ago, I think, but it's uh, the NDA has dropped. So it looks really good um, to me. I, I think it's, I've heard some rumblings from people who wish it looked more like Doom uh, 2016. And it is certainly more hyper. <laughs> it's, uh, it's on, on like speed. It, the mobility in this game is crazy. Like you have dashes, the grappling hook, you're double jumping all the time. Um, it feels like it's uh, an intense game. And I've heard some people say that it might be disappointing if you like the style of Doom, the, the, the original one from 2016. I understand that, that concern, but I don't share it. I think if I want more Doom, it's like, th that's the danger, right? You, you do a, a sequel and you do more of the same and it's fun, but it's fun for lo less long than if you take a little bit of risks, change it a little bit and bring something new, um, which kind of uh, uh, renews the fun of the franchise. Um, and Doom, it's not like, even though Doom 2016 was a reinvention of the, the formula, it's not like Doom was so new that you could, uh, you know... Uh, um, you can just just do the same thing over and over again and uh, it's not going to get old as quickly. Like, we know what Doom is. So for, for even for a reinvention of the game, I think you need to bring in new things in the sequel to keep it fresh. So yeah, uh, I mean, Doom Eternal is coming out in March, I think. I, yeah, let me check. Doom Eternal, March. Can't remember. Uh, okay, well, let's say March. Uh, March 20, there you go. Yeah, so we still have a few weeks to to go before it's available. Um, Temtem has been uh, talked about quite a bit in the past few days. Temtem is an MMO in early access. Uh, I think it's on Steam and Humble Bundle. I think it might even be uh, produced by Humble. I think it's it they they put money into that thing. I'm not sure. Um but it's early access and it is in an MMO Pokemon essentially. And people seem to really like it. Um it is really pretty. It is well thought out. It's uh somewhat complex and deep um but also cute and approachable. They have uh, they have no chat system, which I think is a really smart thing, given that it would probably be targeted at uh, children, um, among other target groups. But certainly, uh, uh, children will want to play it, and so they have a, a strong emote system uh, for communication. You have two v two. Uh, battles. Um, you can evolve your creatures. You can. Um, breed them and transfer abilities from one to the other it's it seems like a it seems like a cool thing and also somehow a missed opportunity for nintendo who keeps making similar um pokemon games i i mean they're not targeting the same players maybe um they want things to be incredibly approachable and maybe heavy online uh, aspects make it less approachable for nintendo in their mind i think there's some truth to that um but i mean it looks like uh, something that could blow up so wanted to mention it and uh if you want to go check it out it is on steam and humble and it's called temtem like Taming, uh, except it's T-E-M. Um, yeah, so Temtem looks pretty cool. Ninja Theory has uh, teased a couple of things. They have announced, of course, Senua's Saga, uh, Hellblade 2, for the Xbox uh, Series X. 
And they've announced a couple of other projects, one um, that both are like interesting and experimental. One is called Project Mara, and it aims at getting you to experience fear uh, and mental terror is what they're saying. It's not so much a game, it's like an experiment. Um, and the other thing they're doing, um, I can't remember. It's There's another project which is uh, also very interesting. They seem to be doing things um, that are focused on psychology, like psychic states. <laughs> I don't know. Like ex getting people to experience um, different different uh, uh, emotions and turning those into game-like experiences. It's, uh, I don't know exactly what to think of it yet. We'll have to wait and see, but it is an interesting approach. Um, Rocket League is going to drop support for Mac and Linux. Um, they say it's because they are integrating new technology and uh, that isn't available on those platforms, which is completely understandable. I think it, it I, I'd be curious to see what technology it is, but uh, even if it's just, you know, those platforms are problematic for install base reason, gamer install base reason. And it, it isn't really the self-fulfilling prophecy that some people might, might claim it is. Um, it's like, oh, there aren't games, so there aren't gamers, so there aren't games, so there aren't gamers. It's really that um, there are serious, um, at least with the Mac, Linux is kind of a different beast, um, but there is a serious technology problem with the Mac. And I can get into that if you want to. But um, the, essentially, the core issue is that uh, Macs come with... Um, integrated graphics cards, which are not powerful at all. Um, and I, I, wrote, I wrote an article about this on my personal blog, patrickbeja.com, um, when Overwatch was announced. That was four years ago, but the situation hasn't changed much. So go to patrickbeja.com, search for Overwatch in the search box, and you'll find the article titled the, si the Sad State of Mac Gaming and Why It's Getting Worse. Essentially, it's because uh, Apple keeps using integrated graphics cards, and that just doesn't work for um, serious gaming. So, yeah, and I think that's a core reason for this. I don't know that for a fact, but it wouldn't surprise me. Um, yeah, so Mac gamers, sorry, but it seems like things aren't improving. And that's about it. Um, oh, there's, I mean, there's a couple of things I could uh, cover, but I do want to get to uh, charts in just a second uh, and numbers. Um, Smash Bros, Smash Brothers has a uh, new DLC announced, uh, including Fire Emblem, and there's a DLC for Fire Emblem Three Houses. Uh, if you like that, you're probably aware. Uh, Bioshock, uh, Metro are coming to the Switch, it would seem. Uh, Metro is confirmed, I think. Bioshock isn't, but it wouldn't be surprising. Devil May Cry 3 just came to for the Switch. All of that is minor uh, there were there was a an a q and a about half life uh, alex which we didn't really learn a lot on so i'm going to skip over um i do want to get however to the um top games sold in the us for um the decade and that is uh, numbers from i believe the esa npd sorry it's it's the npd um, there are some things that are included, like uh, Nintendo doesn't uh, share their numbers for um, um, online store, so those aren't counted. But, I mean, okay, out of the 20 most sold games during the decade, um, the first one is Grand Theft Auto V, which is not going to be surprising anyone. But beyond that, top 10, Call of Duty Black Ops, Call of Duty Black Ops 2, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, Call of Duty Black Ops 3, Call of Duty Ghosts, Red Dead Redemption 2, Call of Duty World War 2, Call of Duty Black Ops 4, and then Minecraft in the 10th position. That is seven 
Call of Duty games out of the 10 uh, highest grossing revenue games of the decade. Seven. Uh, that's the US and they love Call of Duty. We understand this. But oh my God, it's like we all know as like core gamers we play, we look at Call of Duty and we're like, oh yeah, like it's Call of Duty and FIFA and the sports game. They're the games that everyone buys. Um, and, and like they're the occasional gamers games that they buy every year and they buy a couple of games and that's it. But we don't really understand how powerful that franchise is. It's crazy. And by the way, this is the top 10. Uh, if you take the top 20, there are three more Call of Duty games <laughs> in, that, um, in that top. Like, out of the top 20 games, all of the Call of Duty games that were released during that decade are in the, 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 the chart. It is insane. And seven of them are in the top 10. I, you know, it's uh, difficult to understate or to overstate how powerful that franchise continues to be. Um, again, I think we scoff at it a little bit, uh, a little bit too often. So I just wanted to mention it and to drill into uh, our heads as knowers of the industry, how important that franchise is. Um, Epic now has 108 million users. Uh, to compare this to something we can relate to, uh, Steam had 90 million users by January 2019. So a year ago, they had um, 90 million users. So it's probable that they have about the same or maybe at more, uh, a few more users than uh, Epic. But obviously Epic launched like their game store a year and a half ago. And again, it's like the microcosm of gamers. And we heard so much about how people are angry at Epic. Again, this is another proof that a lot of noise and not a lot of actual effect. Um, Epic in a year and a half got everyone to uh, use their service. Now, of course, they count everything. Like if you logged in and you have to have purchased quote unquote a game. So even if you got a free game from their offering, you are counted in this. But it is, it does mean you have a an account and you installed the thing and got your free game. So you're in their si in the system. Even if you didn't use it for the past year, I guess some of them, some of those might, but uh, it's the same with uh, with Steam. So yeah, it's interesting to note as well. Um, it seems that uh, Google is work with, working with uh, Steam to add support to Chrome OS, which there are a lot of Chrome OS uh, devices, especially with students which might be interesting for some types of games for Steam. Um, so yeah, that's just uh, something I, I thought I would mention. ByteDance is working towards getting games, uh, another side of their business. If you don't know what ByteDance is, they are the company behind uh, TikTok, which is one of the most popular apps in the world right now. And uh, they are also going to um, launch into games, it seems. They're building a giant team, a thousand plus uh, people, and uh, they're buying game studios. So they're getting into games. It's a Chinese company, so it's possible that they will make uh, Chinese targeted games, which are mobile and, um, you know, a, a specific kind of games uh, for mobile. But it's also possible they'll, they'll target the Western market for other types of games. Um, it seems unlikely at this stage, though, but just thought I'd mention it as well. And finally, there was a um, Super Nintendo World trailer slash advertisement, um, <laughs> which doesn't show you... Oh, so that thing, if you don't know what it is, it is a theme park uh, that Nintendo is creating in a partnership with Universal Studios in Japan. And I mean, it's it could be fun, but that trailer is in pure Nintendo fashion, 
super weird and doesn't show any uh, doesn't show us anything about what the rides and theme park will actually be like. So, uh, but if you want to have a laugh, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, should be ready for the um, Olympics though. So uh, we'll see more about that later. I wonder what they'll do. They they claim it's going to be a real life game. And you'll have the uh, a kind of watch type thing on your wrist that will make it into uh, a gaming experience in real life. Mm, we'll see. And uh, finally, finally, um, if you have X Xbox Game Pass, which what you're what are you doing if you if you don't? Um, there are a number of games that have been added, including uh, a Plague Tale Innocence. And um, Indivisible, which some people might want to give a try. And Children of Morta, which I have been um, singing the praises of for the past few weeks. And uh, so if you haven't bought it yet, which, by the way, if you have, uh, don't be sad. Don't think you uh, missed out on getting it for free. Think that you supported the developer even more. You did a great thing and got a great game in um, uh, for that. And uh, you should be happy and proud, as I am, for having purchased A Plague Tale Innocence a few weeks before it came out on uh, Game Pass. Um, no, but seriously, though, I think, you know, Game Pass is, like, awesome to get stuff that you didn't think you wanted enough to actually purchase them um on their own so don't be sorry if you bought it it's the opposite be proud and happy that's my advice uh but yeah if you didn't buy it uh go check it out on game pass it is an awesome game children of morta all right that is going to be it for this episode thank you so much for uh listening uh, if you want more of what I do, you can check me out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'm not Patrick on all of those platforms. So next time you're looking at your Instagram and thinking, hmm, I would like to know what Patrick's up to, go to the ad uh, following someone and check out Not Patrick. I post a number of really cool pictures, I think. And uh, if you want to comment on what I said, go to frenchspin.com and find the article for this episode. And that's going to be it. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another episode. I hope you enjoy that time. And I uh, send a lot of hugs and good thoughts your way because I'm a nice person. Talk to you in a couple of weeks. Bye. <laughs>